Okay, we're live again by by 0210, section 59, I think it is. Is anyone out there? Anyone out there? Hmm, I'm going to try something here. Let's see. Stupification. Okay, 59. Oh no! No, why did you do that? Why? Oh, you got oh there we go. Oh, cancel. Okay, good. Shakira, how are you this morning? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Chakira? Oh, good, good. All right, that's great. They were having some problems this morning with the live chat, so um, I'm not sure if what I said got across to section 58, but you're in 59, and you're still healthy, right? I'm glad to hear that. And my wife's a lot better right now, too. She has what they call temporal arteritis. That's an inflammation of the temporal arteries that come up on either side of her head. Not fun for her to have. Affects your vision. It gives you headaches. It was tough. She still has it, but we've got it under control. I hope you never get it. It's probably Mr. Malikowski uh, sending me an email. It's been kind of interesting with some equipment that didn't want to work for a while. And this is somewhat new to me in a different way. It's all online. We never had any face-to-face -face like you and I did, you know, back in the spring. So anyway... We'll see if anybody get, else gets on. I sent them an email and told them I was on it. So we'll give them a couple of minutes, and then you and I will start.
Shakira, are you working this summer while you take this course? Oh, that's good. So you don't have any responsibilities, right, in the sense of working, unless you maybe you're watching over little brothers and sisters or something. That's great. You don't have some guy who wants to take you out every night, do you? You know, you're not an ugly woman. You're a nice looking lady. You got some guy who likes to take you out? <laughs> that sounds good, Shakira. I just want him to have the same uh, goal as you do in that sense. So he supports you in your goal of becoming a nurse. Are you going to be a nurse, radiology technician, or what? Mm, okay, good. <clears throat> That's a nice profession. You'll get to see some people who take good care of their teeth, and you'll see people who, oh, my. Some of them don't do very well. But you can make a nice living in it, and I hope you'll enjoy it. Well, it's about 11 after 10, so how about you and I just rolling along here? Uh, I have, let me ask you this, Shakira, did you get in your email in D2L uh, a copy of this week's um, information that I hope to cover? Good. I'm glad it came through to you. So that means the other kids got it too. I see we got a third person in the uh, group here. And uh, don't know who that is. It lists three people, you and me and whoever else the third person is. Who is the third person who is online with us? Well, I guess they're just not going to answer. Or maybe they don't know how. You can type something in if you're on uh, looking in on YouTube. Uh, anyway, I'm Mr. Pritchett, if you're in here for Biology 210. And uh, I sent you a handout. Uh, this week's material that we hope to cover. So... Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with that. Uh, assume you have either a textbook, uh, the Pearson textbook of anatomy and physiology, or uh, if you, you're going to be working in D2L, uh, then you, uh, you could have the e-text, which is real nice. And so you can uh, 
uh, look at the figures and so forth that I'm going to get you to look at and the pages that I want you to read and understand. Now, when you, uh, I think you have a lab this week, maybe a couple of them, uh, since it's a semester crammed into 10 weeks. And uh, so we're going to be doubling up and you'll be, you'll be learning some things in uh, the lab that I will include on lecture tests. You're going to be looking at uh, parts of the body and positions of the body, interior, dorsal, all these directional terms and planes. I'm not going to cover that because he will cover that, but I will ask some, some questions about that. Uh, Mr. Malakowski would like for us to do that because the final exam and uh, uh, 25 or 40 questions uh, will be a comprehensive exam, and that means that you'll have some questions from the lab as well as from the lecture. So having said that, and hoping you have a textbook or you have an e-text, uh, I'm on page 21, and we want to look at module 1.5. Module 1.5, and that is on page 21 of your textbook, or it's, it's probably on the same page if they have pages in that e-text, but module 1.5, so we're in chapter 1, and the title is Core Principles in Anatomy and Physiology. Now, as you notice, um, on page 21, and you're looking in the first column, you see the core principles in anatomy and physiology. And I want you to make sure you look at the learning outcomes that are listed below. There are six of them there. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. Obviously, questions could come from that. And so as you, if you focus on those, in this case, six outcomes, which means this is six things we want you to grasp mentally, uh, have a knowledge of, and then have an ability to uh, perhaps explain it. We don't want you to just memorize stuff. We do want you to memorize it. You got to. You got to have it in your head before you can use it. But we want you to be able to use it. Maquasia, are you the third person? How are you? Did you get that copy I sent you this morning or last night? Great. I'm glad you got it. Okay, my question, um, we're on page 21. I guess you're there too, aren't you? And so um, we're looking on page 21 in the textbook. And we're in module 1.5. So you want to look those over, those learning and outcomes. That's what we want you to, to know. Now, we're going to talk about this a little bit because it's really central in so many aspects of our life. So as you look in the second column, you see it says overall theme, physiological processes operate to maintain the body's homeostasis. Now, a homeostasis is a word that means uh, the balance that we want to have inside our bodies. There are lots of things going on inside our body, and they have to be balanced. If it gets out of balance, we usually suffer in some way. But we have uh, mechanisms, or they call them physiological processes, that's fine, because it is physiology. Physiology is the function of an organism, of an organ. And anatomy is the structure of the organ. But the, uh, 
these mechanisms, homeostatic mechanisms, that is not listed in the um, couple of paragraphs in that second column. They call them physiological processes. But get used to thinking about homeostatic mechanisms. Those are physiological processes which keep the internal environment constant. There are probably hundreds of homeostatic uh, examples. Um, one of the ones that we've covered before in other classes is uh, the temperature in your body. And so you have a temperature that could be within a range. You know, we, we typically think of 98.6 as normal, but uh, it can rise, it can drop, and our body is set up in a way, chemically, so that 98.6 is what we call the optimum temperature. In other words, that's the best. But people have little variations. Some people might carry a 96 or 97. Uh, that's important to know um, for school nurses because when a kid comes in and has a 99 or 100 uh, temperature, and they say, well, that's not too bad. But they need to find out if that kid runs a low temperature um, normally instead of 98.6 or 98.5 or 4, something like that, that kid might run a 95. Well, if you get him up to 100, that's like you and me going up to 103, 104, see? And so you have to understand there is a scale there, a sliding scale. And so it's important to know that, especially with those kids in school. But anyway, we've got a mechanism that will keep the temperature in our body stable. If it gets too low or too high, then we have problems. So we've got a number of homeo homeostatic mechanisms uh, that, uh, that keep our inside uh, balanced. you got all these things like blood pressure, heart rate, um, the level of sugar in your bloodstream and so forth how much sodium is in your body. Uh, so the, the mechanisms all work because our genetics is set up that way so that we can enjoy going on a vacation and going swimming or hiking or something like that. And those mechanisms work without our telling them to do that. It's set up so that we can concentrate on other things. So having said that, uh, as you look at the bottom of page, not quite the bottom of page 21, but you see this little box down in the second column that says quick check. Now, as you look at that, you see it asks questions, doesn't it? Guess who might ask some of those questions? Could be Mr. You got Mr. Davis, maybe for for lab, or Mr. Boggs. I'm not sure which one. I think those are the two. You might have Ms. Watson. But uh, anyway, those are meant for you to stop. And it says, "What is homeostasis?" Well, now you can certainly memorize up top where you see it says the maintenance of the body's internal environment keeping it balanced, however you, you can change the words around like that. But that's what you want to be able to do is to be able to give a definition, give an explanation of what goes on. Now, we're going to talk about an explanation now. And if you'll look right below that quick check box, you'll see there's a core principle. And it says feedback loops are a key mechanism to main homeostatic, homeostasis. Feedback. You get feedback from people, right? Uh, you know, when you and I were children, um, sometimes we would get out of hand, as children normally do. We've all got that nature to just sometimes create problems. And that might have been inside the house. 
And so your mother or your father may have spoken to you or, or maybe got a little firmer with you and your behavior changed. Some of us had fathers that um, when they looked at us, we knew we were on the radar and we knew that we needed to stop what we were doing. That's what they call negative feedback. It changes the activity. That's what happens when we uh, get too hot. Let's say, you know, it's supposed to be 80, 85 today or something, which is a pretty nice temperature. It was a little warmer yesterday. But if you go walk a mile, if you enjoyed a little exercise, well, you came back with a little sweat on you. And so your body temperature rose because all those contractions of muscles generate heat and the heat's got to go somewhere. We got to lose it. And one way we lose it is we sweat. So that's a negative feedback. Hang on one second. Let me see what's going on with the phone here. And we tell you guys not to have phones, don't we? It's hard to be consistent, isn't it? We'll let them talk to the machine downstairs. Let's see, where were we? Um, so those muscles generate that heat. The temperature starts rising in the body, and then your body begins to sweat. Now, on a nice day when you don't have much humidity, that sweat evaporates and takes away the heat and keeps the body at some whatever normal it is for that body, 98 degrees, let's say. So, having said that, let's look at some of the components that are involved in, this case, temperature change, and then you can apply these generally to other homeostatic mechanisms in the body. So if you look down at the bottom of page 22, And you can, you can read this about negative feedback. So I want you to do that. But you look at the bottom, that first column, you see it says, let's see how negative feedback loops work in general. Now what you're interested here, interested in here are those bold print terms. You've got to have a stimulus. In our case, it was the heat being generated by muscular activity. And then you have a receptor. You can call it a sensor if you like that name. It picks up on the rise in the heat. It's a nerve tissue that perceives temperature. Isn't that amazing? Some of them don't perceive temperature. They perceive pressure. Somebody's squeezing your hand firmly or whatever. So you've got a stimulus that gets picked up by a receptor. The receptor sends a message to the... Um, Oh, there you go. Let's see what I can do there. Um, sends it to a control center. Could be the brain. And so the brain then processes that information sends out a message, look at the top of the next column, through an effector, or to an effector, I should say. And in our, let's say with temperature, the effector would be the sweat glands. And they would begin to release water to evaporate. When the water evaporates, it cools the body. That's the physiological response, the cooling of the body. So we've got all these different mechanisms that have a receptor, a control center, and an effector. So the sensor or the receptor picks up the stimulus, 
sends it to the central control, so to speak. Message comes out, turns on some sort of a mechanism that uh, changes, that brings the temperature back, in this case, to what is the preset temperature that you've got genetically. And you don't worry about it. You come back a bit damp from uh, exercising, but your body temperature is still within a good range, and so you don't have any uh, proteins destroyed. So that's a negative feedback. It changes what the stimulus is causing, just like it changed our behavior as children. Now, there's also what they call a positive feedback loop. If you look down at the bottom of page 22, you see that. You know, before we get into that for just a second, you can see some examples on page 23 of your textbook. You see the radiant heat, um, and um, you can see the little cycle that's there about uh, heat being given off, and it'll turn on and off depending upon what the, the setting is. Same thing down here with the body where the, the muscles, you're cold, uh, and your muscles start contracting, you shiver, and you generate some heat. You get away, keep away the cold. Now, what we want to do for just a moment is think about a positive feedback mechanism. A positive feedback mechanism means that our response to the stimulus is to even make the condition greater. We increase the condition, the stimulus. We increase the stimulus. We don't tone it down, that would be negative feedback. But in the case here, in this positive feedback, is you increase the stimulus. And one of the best ones, best examples that I know of, and there are others in the body, but most of them are negative feedback mechanisms, is um, when you're pregnant and that child grows within the womb and stretches that muscle, that muscle in the uterus begins to contract. It's starting to push that child out of the womb. So when the muscle starts contracting, that sends a message to your brain. In your brain, there's a structure called the hypothalamus. Don't worry about the name right now. You will get it toward the end of the semester. And so... Uh, that message going to the brain, that particular part of the brain, that particular part of the brain releases a hormone which goes into the bloodstream and makes the uterus contract even more. So instead of stopping the contraction, which would be negative feedback, it causes it to contract more. So we say that's positive feedback. You increase the original condition. And in that case, it's the contraction of the uterine wall. And of course, after the child comes out, well, don't need to contract anymore. Except a little bit, you know, to help seal those blood vessels and so forth. Given birth is uh, going to have some blood coming out the reproductive tract. So that's an example of a positive feedback mechanism. So you want to know those. Again, as you look on page 25, you see quick check. How do negative feedback loops maintain homeostasis? Explain how positive and negative feedback loops differ. You see, when you can answer that, not only do you have some knowledge about a stimulus and a response and a receptor and so forth, but you can put it together. You can explain it. If you can explain something, then you know it. And that's our goal for you. Mr. Malakowski and I, are teaching these courses in anatomy, and that's what we want for you. Because when you go out there as an FDTC graduate, I want you to be able to uh, process information and uh, understand what's going on. 
a dentist or whoever you're going to work for will think this kid's got some marbles upstairs and they're all in the right place. You have a good relationship there. Okay, page 25. Uh, just a short thought here. Second principle, structure and function are related. Now, let's look at how that plays out. If you look at the bottom, figure 115, you see that picture of the person's lungs. And you look over to the right, the two boxes to the right, and you see where it says lung tissue, the little sacs, if you're not familiar with that, you will be a little bit later. I think that comes up in bio 210, 211. The sacs through which we exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen are one cell thick. One cell thick. This is what the coronavirus was ripping up with some of its physical features, according to what I saw on one of the, the uh, reports on 6 o'clock news or 6.30 news. So the lung tissue is very thin so that oxygen can get through into the bloodstream quickly and easily. And CO2, which is a waste product of our metabolism, our chemical activity, get out very easily. If you have a thickening of that membrane, you see there, instead of having one layer, they've got about two, three, four, five, six, seven, about, got about eight layers. Those gases, <clears throat> excuse me, will not traverse, cross that many cells easily. So the person will have air hunger. They'll feel like they're not getting enough. And not only that, but the carbon dioxide will not get out as easily. And that creates a condition changing the acidity of the blood. So structure and function are related to each other. Okay, let's go over to page 26. And you can explain that. See up at the top, be on the lookout for quick check how our structure and function are related. You want to be able to talk to somebody about that. Now, as you look in the second column, you see core principle three, and that's gradients, drive many phys physiological um, processes. So when you think of a gradient, If you come down in that uh, first sentence, a gradient is present. It's a situation, a condition where something exists. Could be a gas, could be a liquid or something like that. Could even be electricity. Something exists in one area that, uh, than another, and the two areas are connected. More of something exists in one section than in the other section. So we can have, if you look at the bottom, we can have a heat gradient, a temperature gradient, and you can see from the little bar down at the bottom, figure, uh, figure 1.16, And you see right around that heat, it's 80 degrees, but the farther you get away from it, the temperature drops. That's a heat gradient. Now think about how that's important for us to shed heat when we have gotten into um, an athletic event. Our body has to be able to shed some of that heat. Sometimes you can, you can even look at a person and you can see the wavy heat coming from them, the, um, the gradient greater in their body than in the environment. Now, what happens when the environment is warmer than your body? Mm, well, that creates a bit of a challenge, doesn't it? 
Mm -hmm. Try to get rid of that heat. We might not be able to do that. So you can have a heat gradient. You can also have a chemical gradient, if you will, or they call it a concentration gradient. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. You see there where they've taken a tablet. Um, you might even think of something like sugar. Put sugar in tea. And a lot of times the sugar settles to the bottom. But if you leave it long enough, the sugar will eventually work its way up and it will dissolve in that liquid and everything pretty much even. But right at first, you've got a concentration gradient. You've got more at one point in the solution than you do in another section of, in this case, the beaker. So you can have a concentration gradient, you can have a temperature gradient, you can have a pressure gradient. And they show that with a syringe, but think of your urinary bladder. We all know when it's time to go visit the bathroom because there's pressure that's greater in that bladder than there is outside. So we have a pressure gradient. And we want that pressure gradient because what's going to happen, you'll hear this a little bit later when you get into the urinary tract, is that muscle that surrounds the bladder, when it gets stretched to a certain point, begins to contract, kind of like the uterus. And that's what forces the water out of your bladder. So we need that concentration, no, excuse me, we need that pressure gradient in order to get all the water out of our bladders. Some people have a hard time with that. If they can't create that pressure gradient, they retain urine, and that sets them up for repeated UTIs, urinary tract infections. Everybody okay so far? Okay, then um, the last thing we want to look at in terms of these principles, these core principles, is cells communicate with each other. We don't understand all of this, but we know cell muscles, which are cells, set a message sent a message to the, uh, the brain, and the brain sends a message back. But it's a chemical message. We've even seen where bacteria concentrate, uh, communicate with each other. We don't understand it. You know, we don't know what their language is or whatever. But cells communicate with each other. That's why we can do a lot of things with our bodies. Our brains are thinking and doing and sending out messages. Our eyes are picking up images. Our ears are picking up sounds and so forth. And our body is responding to what we see and what we hear. That's communication. Through nerves, through chemicals, through hormones and so forth. It's an amazing body that you and I live in. Tremendously amazing. Uh, they mention in this little section here, um, electrical signals, you come down about six or eight lines and you see in the middle electrical signals or chemical messengers. Uh, you'll hear things about them like hormones and neurotransmitters and, and stuff like that. So anyway, Page 27, and you see there, quick check. Make sure you look those over. Now, on page 29, just go through the core principles again, where it says module 1.5.
And then uh, down on page 29 where it says assess what you have learned, level one, you will pick some of that knowledge up in the lab. We already know anatomy is a form and then the function is physiology. But come on over to the second column. You see um, organization, group uh, number five, groups of cells working to get together to perform a common function known as. You'll learn what that is in the lab. But I will incorporate some of those questions to my lecture test, which I've got to start building right now because next Thursday we'll probably have a, la a lecture test. We only got 10 weeks. We want to see if we can get in five tests. So you want to um, no, do number five, do number seven. Um, eight does deals with uh, terms that uh, are dealing with distance and direction and so forth. And you got nine upper and lower limbs and terms there. And then over on page 30, they give you some more things about direction. They give you um, questions about the planes like sagittal plane, frontal plane, and those will be ones that you cover in the lab. Uh, come on down to 10, 11, 12, and 13, and 16. Yeah. And there's one I missed right there, number 18. So what happens when you're working in a home there? You got a phone in there. Do either of you have any questions so far about those core principles? All right. So let's go on over to page 31 where you see the chemistry of life. Chapter 2. So we're going to look at this is module 2.1. We're going to look at atoms and elements. Again, look at the learning outcomes. Get those set in your head. What am I looking for? Well, you want to look for information that Helps you describe the charge, the mass, and the relative location of protons, electrons, and neutrons. So make sure you read through that before we before you start, when you start studying it. But you can highlight down at the bottom, and you probably have this on the sheet that I sent you about matter, and I've got matter and chemistry. You want to be able to define it. To define it means that you have some sort of understanding about it. And that's what we want you to get, is some understanding. And uh, you see chemistry. And then we come on over to page 30. And here we start with the atom and atomic structure. And you see what an atom and it, an atom. Some of you may, might remember Adam Ant. Wasn't that guy a good guy went around helping people? Uh, tiny little fellow, though. <laughs> But you see there, uh, it's the smallest unit of matter that still retains its original properties. And most of us, when we think of property, we think of the half acre we live on out here. So uh, that's one way to apply that. But properties uh, could deal with color, could deal with how dense the material is? Is it really light? Is it very dense and compact? What is its boiling point? When would it melt? You don't have to know all that. Those are what they talk about when they think about properties. But they're characteristics of the, uh, the substance there. So that's atom is the smallest unit of matter. And if you stop and think about it, we are we are made up of atoms. Your book here kind of hits it 
it makes you think about it for a second. You see it says uh, human, has, human cell roughly is made up of 100 trillion atoms. 100 trillion atoms. That's one cell. And our bodies are made up of cells. And the average body is made up of 37 trillion cells. And those cells are made of atoms. Sometimes you just have to stop and think about this. Because the numbers are just astounding, aren't they? And all, well, we'll get into it in just a little bit. Excuse me, I get a little excited about some of the stuff. I enjoy it. That's why I'm here. Okay, so you know what an atom is. And you see it's composed of subatomic particles. Particles that are smaller than the whole atom. And you hear the... You hear the uh, you have here the prote uh, uh, three particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons positive charge, neutrons ne neutral, electrons are negative. Protons and neutrons are in. They form. They actually form the nucleus. Now, <laughs> you know when you when you start studying this stuff, you begin to say. What keeps those guys together? Why don't they, the protons, which are positive charges, won't they push apart from each other? Science doesn't have it all together. They have some ideas about things. But all life is uh, amazing. Just amazing. So, I hope you get amazed too and enjoy the course. But anyway... Those are the three subatomic uh, subatomic particles, and you come down to where it says all atoms are electrically neutral. Now we know something's positive; that's different from something that's negative. But overall, in an atom that's got all its electrons, all its uh, protons, all its neutrons, they cancel out each other. They're neutral electrically they're neutral electrically and you come to the second uh, paragraph there the bulk of the atoms mass we we tend to want to use mass as weight um, i probably have more mass than you do i'm uh, six one i'm weighing 215 pounds so i probably um, have more mass than you do but um, the, the mass of the atom really lies in the number of protons and the uh, number of uh, neutrons. So 99% or more of an atom's mass is in the nucleus. Makes up a tiny fraction of an atom's volume because you've got these electrons spinning around outside the nucleus. You can look down below and you see a picture, an illustration, figure 2.1 of carbon. When you look in the nucleus, you see six protons. That's the ones with a little positive on them and six neutrons. That's not always the case, but that's just the way it is with carbon. And then you see these little fellows that are spinning around the outside. Now, they will call those little tracks that the electron travels around. And you ask, why does it do that? Why does it go like that? Why did it just leave? Well, maybe the protons are positive enough to hold it, but... The track that it goes on could be called a shell, as you see at the top of the next column. 
or you could call it an orbit. Sometimes people will call them orbitals, but you can call it the orbits, kind of like the Earth goes around the, the uh, sun. So those tracks, those paths that the electron travels around, always moving, and they're moving inside our body. I guess they don't ever rest. Now we, we rest and recuperate six, eight hours a night because we've been busy spending energy. So that's what we, why we do that, get some energy built up. But those little electrons keep traveling, and they travel in those shells. And if you look in the second column, you come down to where you see the three bullets, and you'll see the first shell, second shell, and third shell. Now, we're not going to get into all these different shells. Some of them have a lot of shells. We're not getting into that. Just a little bit. I'm going to go past three. <coughs> Excuse me. First shell, closest to the nucleus, it can only hold two electrons. I'm not sure why. This is just what we observe. What we can see, we sometimes don't comprehend. But we can learn to work with it. It's kind of like your transmission in your car. You might look at the transmission under the car and if you ever get to go to a shop and they show you a transmission, you look at it and go, good grief, look at all those pieces in there. You can recognize it as a transmission, but you also can use it. You don't have to understand it to use it. You just need to know where P, R, and D, and you can get wherever you need to go. That's all you need to know. So anyway, first shell. Those two electrons, second shell will hold eight, and the third can hold 18. But it's interesting they describe it as being satisfied with eight electrons in there. <clears throat> and that usually evens out to what the proteins are. So it's neutrally charged. So you come down to quick check again. There's some questions. And let's see, we need to go down to the elements in the periodic table. Now, as you look at the periodic table on the next page, you've probably seen that somewhere along the line in high school. And, of course, the letters represent elements. So come back down to where you see elements in the periodic table. And you see the number of protons that an atom contains is called its atomic number. And atomic numbers and, and an atom's atomic number defines its, a, its particular element, which can't be broken down further, at least by chemical means. Now, we've split the atom, and there's a lot of energy in that atom. You blow things up by splitting the atom. That's what they talk about when they talk about the hydrogen bomb. Release tremendous amounts of energy. This is my wedding ring. Got some gold in it. And gold is a metal, you know that, and people kill for it. As you look over on the periodic table, you're looking at a table of elements. They can't be broken down further by chemical means. And you see the little red staircase over to the right? That's a division between nonmetals on the right and metals on the left. Now, don't go memorize that periodic table. I'm going to ask you to do that. You're going to do chemistry, that's one thing. But, but we're not going to do that. So, 
As you look at the periodic table, you see the abbreviation and you see the little number above it. That's the atomic number. And that's the number of protons that are present. in the atom. So when you look at <clears throat> hydrogen, atomic number is one. You come over to the, uh, you come down to the Na, that's sodium. We have sodium. You guys salt like salt on stuff? Well, my wife does. <clears throat> I like salt on french fries, but for the most part, you know, whatever seasonings in there is, is okay with me um, but my wife has a real taste for salt I like it also have a taste for pepper what do you like but anyway sodium's got 11 protons in its neutrons in its nucleus and then you see K and CA CA uh, is a metal and it's called calcium where do you get calcium from where do you get your daily allotment of calcium? Well, I had a glass of milk this morning that was some calcium. Somebody brought a pound cake over for my wife's birthday on Sunday. And so I had, I had some calcium in there too because, you know, they had a pound cake. They made a pound cake. And if I remember correctly, that's got some butter, which comes from milk. And then, of course, they put some milk in there, too. So, and see, I also had a cream uh, icing on it. Cream comes from milk, see? So I got a good dose of, of calcium this morning, which is necessary for a number of things. So anyway, you look at hydrogen up there. We're not going to go memorize all this stuff now. But I want you to know the ones that are sort of... Uh, what would you say, kind of orangey colored? And you see hydrogen, you come over to the right, and you see carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Now look above the chart, and you see it says major elements. Now, that's major in our bodies. Our bodies basically are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. 96% of our body is that. Then if you look at the green ones, you see they're called minerals. And we need sodium. The K is potassium. That doesn't always fit with the name, does it? Uh, the, K, the K comes from... Um, uh, probably Latin. I've forgotten what it is. Kalium or kaolin or something like that. But it's potassium. And then you see Mg for magnesium, Ca for calcium. You come over to the other three green ones. The P is phosphorus. See the green one over there? P. Got uh, what, 15 uh, protons and sulfur. Do some of you have people who... Uh, and your family who will take sulfur and put it around the house, and they'll say it will keep snakes away. I don't know if it does or not. I had one lady in our church, and she put sulfur in her shoes, said it helped her arthritis. Hey, if it helps, that's all right. It's not illegal. <laughs> I just never heard of doing that. There's a lot of things I haven't heard of doing. And then you see CL, which is chlorine. We typically think of Clorox when we uh, think of that but we got to have some chlorine also as minerals, 4% as minerals. So there you're up to 100% basically. But we have these other things, and you don't have to know those other things. You just want to know the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen at this point. Uh, we'll mention sulfur and chloride and so forth a little bit later. But uh, you see these blue things in here. Don't have to know them, okay? I'm just going to mention they're what they call trace, just a little bit. And if you look in the very middle, 
You see, Fe. We need iron. Fe comes from ferrous. F e r r o u s, and we need that iron because we need it for our manufacturing in our bone marrow of hemoglobin. So we have to take some iron in. Sometimes people have iron deficiency anemia, and the doctor will give them um, tablets of iron, which sometimes upset people's uh, GI tract and so forth. <clears throat> it's good if you can absorb it from food. And so uh, we need some of those things. Okay. You all right with that so far? Okay. Shakira says, no, sir. Uh, it, what was the question? Or maybe I said, did I ask you a question? And maybe you put no, sir. Or do you have anything you, you have a question about so far? Okay, we've been going for about an hour. You might need to go to the little boy's room, little girl's room, or anything like that. Take a few minutes break here. Stretch, get up, and walk away. Let's just take a couple of minutes. We'll come back, and we'll pick up with isotopes and radioactivity. Notice at the bottom of page 33. Okay, quick check. Okay, a couple of minutes. Okay. Kelsey Brown. I got a Brittany Brown. And... Hmm. Well, Kelsey, uh, I don't have you on the list. Now, are you taking Bio 210? Biology 210, Anatomy and Physiology?
Kelsey, are you out there? Mm, well, I guess maybe she's not. Maybe she's left. Okay, we're down to two. Okay, so are you there, Shakira? Shakira? And Mikwasia? Okay, Mikwasia, are you still there, Marquasia? Okay, good. Okay, I guess Kelsey, maybe she left. Maybe she figured she was in the wrong thing. That's okay, though. Sometimes that happens. So we're still on page 33, and we're looking at isotopes. We want to mention just the, the name and what it is. Now, you already know the atomic number is that little number up top, and that atomic number is the number of proteins. <laughs> I'm so anxious to get to protein synthesis. Excuse me, protons. Uh, that little number up there, it tells you how many protons the atom has in its nucleus. Now, come down over here in the second column where you see isotopes and radioactivity. Um, Shakira, Mikwesha, do you have any um, relatives who maybe who have taken radiation treatments? Maybe for a cancer or something? Okay, so you know a little bit of what I'm talking about. We can use an isotope sometimes that will give off radiation that will kill cancer cells. Now, come down in that paragraph to where you see the bold print term um, mass number. And you see the mass number of an atom is represented by uh, the mass of an atom is represented by a number called the mass number, and that equals to the number of neutrons plus the number of protein uh, protons. Oh, I'm gonna get to proteins yet, aren't I? So ma atomic mass is just the protons. The mass number, which they don't show on here, is the total number of proteins and neutrons. But look in here. Come on down to where you see isotopes. It says right above isotopes, atoms with the same atomic numbers. And remember, that's just the protons. But different mass numbers are called isotopes. So they have different numbers of neutrons. Atoms with the same atomic number, meaning protons, but different mass numbers are called isotopes. So they have different numbers of neutrons in there. So that's what an isotope is. Now, look at the last paragraph. Certain isotopes have very high energy. They're unstable. High energy. They give off radiation. And that's what they use sometimes to treat a cancer. They go through radiation treatments. So they have isotopes that have larger numbers of neutrons than the normal atom. And they can give off radiation. And it's been successful. Yes, there are some side effects with it, but 
People put up with those side effects. They have some kind of medication that diminishes the discomfort. Okay. So, you look on page 34, and you see down at the bottom, quick check. They got them all through here. Don't fail to uh, try to answer those. Good practice. Now, let's look at 2.2. Module 2.2. And you see the title up there, matter combined, could be chemically, could be just physically, mixtures and chemical bonds. And again, when learning outcomes, you want to check number one. I see before we've been doing a lot of them. We won't do all of them because it's not a chemistry course. But distinguish between solution, solute, solvent, colloid, and suspension. Number two, relate the number of electrons in an atom's valence shell. That's the outermost shell. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We're going to want to define the term molecules and ions. Number five. Explain the difference between polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. And number six. Excuse me. So we come down to this little paragraph. Starts off with matter may be combined in two ways. By being physically intermixed or chemically combined. Physically intermixed kind of like let's say glass beads and salt crystals that's a mixture but they're not combined chemically with each other they're simply individual salt molecules and glass molecules or whatever and that's a mixture so their their properties don't change chemical nature of them does not change. Now, uh, come down below mixture, that bold print term mixture, in contrast, when atoms of two or more elements are combined by forming chemical bonds, this is different. The atoms are changed chemically. The properties change a little bit. Maybe the temperature at which it boils comes down lower instead of being up here. Okay, because it's combined chemically with something else. And then you see this word molecule, two or more atoms combined by chemical bonds. Okay. Any questions there? We're going to talk about those chemical bonds. Before we do, though, we're going to give you three examples of mixtures. Look at them at the top of page 35. And you see three, suspension. The substances inside this fluid are suspended, but they eventually settle to the bottom. That's a suspension. And then a colloid is like a suspension. But you see the particles are so small, they, they point out little milk proteins, that they don't settle. They just float. So the pressure of the fluid is equal to whatever their mass is, and they float. They don't settle out. That's a colloid.
if you look in the middle of colloids, you'll see if you come down one, two, three, four, five, five lines, you look over to the right, an example of a colloid in the human body is milk. Okay. And then the cytoplasm, last sentence, cytoplasm in our cells, that's a colloid too. The little suspended particle, they stay suspended. And then you have solutions. You see that's over to the right up there at the top. And one component dissolves the other component. We put crystalline sugar in there, and eventually it all disappears, doesn't it? It's floating in there amongst the water molecules. We say it is dissolved. Now, two words there in that paragraph. You got solution. A solution in a living organism consists of a solid, a liquid, a solid, a liquid, or gas mixed with a liquid. In our case, it's mostly water because we're about 80% water. And the solutions are generally clear. Not like a colloid and not like a suspension. And you come to <clears throat> two bold print terms, solute and solvent. We want to be able to define those. You put sugar in your tea, that is a solute. The tea is the solvent. So make sure you get that straight. And as it mentions again, water is the most important solvent in the human body. Water is a wonderful and amazing substance. It really has some great properties, as we'll see uh, as we look a little bit more down the road. And then you see the last paragraph down there, the, solid, the amount of solute present in the solution is called the concentration. So they give you an example down there, and you can look at uh, that. Um, percentage of a sol solution that is solute. A solution has 10 grams in 90 millimeters of water, and that's equal to 90 grams of water. So you've got a 10% solution. You put 90 and 10 together, that gives you 100. And so, but 10 out of those 100, 10 of those um, particles are the solid. So you say it's a 10% solution. Okay. Now, let's go to um, chemical bonds on page 35 in the second column. You see down there at the bottom, bold print term chemical bond. And they say it's an energy relationship. An attractive force. We bond, don't we? Yeah. I've been bonded to this lady for uh, 45 years. There's a bond there. And you see it says an attractive force. Yeah, I like her. She likes me. And there's a force there that holds us together. Not chemically in, in that way, but anyway. You get the idea. So they, they want to say that a chemical bond is, is sort of an attraction. Now, let's go to page 36 in module 2.2. And uh, you already know molecule, two atoms of, a, of the same element produce a molecule. You already know that. 
macromolecules, macro means big, uh, relatively speaking. And let's look at, come down in that first column to valence electrons and chemical bonding. And you see there chemical bonds are formed from the electrons located in the outermost shell. That's the valence electron. The outermost shell is the valence electron. And so a valence shell, the outermost electrons are in the valence shell. So the electrons present in that valence shell are called valence electrons. And it's those electrons that determine how an atom interacts with other atoms. We don't understand this totally, but you see the word octet rule. You see it says, in general, atoms that are relevant, we're down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines, six lines. And in, actually, in general, the atoms that are relevant to physiology, that's our chemical activity, follow a rule called the octet. Octet means eight. If you have a, a quintet, you've got five people. Octet's got eight people. So the octet rule states that an atom is most stable when it has eight electrons in its valence shell. That's when it seems to be the most stable. When it has eight electrons in the valence shell. Now, we're not going to go past three. You can go a long way on past it, but we're not going to do that. So when you see the next sentence, atoms that have filled the valence shell, such as helium and neon, are non-reactive or inert. Non-reactive. But if they have less... If they don't have eight, then they are more likely to react with another atom. So if you fill the valence shell with eight, that stabilizes the atom. But if it's got less than that, then it tends to be reactive. Now, when two of them are going to join together, look at the bottom of the column. You see it says, as you could see, okay? What we want to do is come on down to the fourth line. The bond allows reactive atoms to obey the octet or, or duet rules. If you just got one shell. And the atoms become more stable. Now, what we want to look at here in terms of that is it says two things may happen to valence electrons when a chemical bond is formed. The electrons can be transferred to another atom. Or the electrons can be shared between two atoms as opposed to just donated. And so when that type of bond is formed, it's not called ionic. When they share, it's called covalent. We share. Co-owners of a business, they share the profits. So we have two kinds of bonds. The ionic bond, in which electrons are donated by one atom and received by another. And then the covalent bond is a situation in which they don't donate, but they share. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? At least I think so.
So in the second column on page 36, you see ion, ions, and, well, there's a quick check up there too. Valence electrons, that's where the action takes place. Whether you get two shells, one shell, three shells, we only want to go up to three. An ionic bond results when electrons are transferred between a metal atom. Remember how we took the, the uh, periodic table and we said everything past this red stair step? That's a metal. Over here is a non-metal. Okay, just keep that in your head. Between a metal and a non-metal. Sodium's a metal. If you go back and look at the uh, uh, periodic table, sodium's on that left side. It's a metal. Chlorine on the other side is a non-metal. So you see what they're saying in, this, in just one little sentence. Ionic bond results when electrons are transferred between a metal atom and a non-metal atom. So we get an ionic bond. Now, if you look at the first uh, illustration there, matter of fact, you can look over it on page 37. You can see sodium got the purple nucleus and chlorine's got the, uh, I don't know what color you call that, sort of gray, gray green or something like that. <clears throat> But you look at that sodium ion and you see that one electron out there. Now remember what the octet rule said. If you get eight out there, it's usually a very stable ion, a stable element. It only has one. And so you look at chlorine. Chlorine has seven. And I guess there's a stability. Because when this ionic bond is made, it makes both of them stable, but it charges them too. Look at the 11 protons in the sodium and count the electrons. And you see you got two, four, six, eight, ten. And in that third shell, you have your 11th electron. Chlorine, got 17 nucleus, so it's going to have 17 um, electrons. And its outermost shell, called a valence shell, has two, four, six, seven. So it's less work to donate an electron to chlorine than it is to take seven away from chlorine and give it to sodium. That just doesn't seem to happen. So sodium donates that one electron, as you see the arrow, and you end up with an extra electron on the chlorine, which means it's now minus charged, but that electron is gone from the sodium, so it has 11 protons and only 10 electrons. So therefore, it is positive Negative one for chlorine, positive one for the sodium. Look at the bottom of page. And you see in 36, it says um, at the very bottom, um, Chlorine atom accepts an electron from another atom, which in this case is sodium, gives it eight electrons in the valence shell. And now it's a negative because it's got an extra ion or extra electron. The number of protons has not changed, but the extra negative charge turns the chlorine atom into a negative ion or an anion. So you want to understand that. Now, since the sodium has donated an electron, it is positively charged. They don't call it an anion. It is an ion, I-O-N, but it's not an anion. An anion 
has and um, is a negatively charged particle. The, the sodium becomes a cation, C-A-T-I-O-N. It has one extra proton in its composition. So now you have a negative chlorine and a positive sodium. Opposites draw toward each other. And so they have an ionic bond due to the transfer. Question on that so far? Let's do one more thing before we close. Um, while we're at it, think about electrolytes. I don't know if you ever drink any sports drinks that you know have sodium in them and things like that. Um, but these are now called electrolytes because it, when you put them in water, they separate, and that water will transfer electricity. So sodium and chlorine can be called ions, like you put on potatoes, like French fries, put salt on potatoes, sodium chloride. But you put that in water, they separate. And now you have what are called electrolytes, sodium and chlorine, floating around. And it'll, it'll carry electrical current. Make sure you look at the quick check down at the uh, bottom of page 37. And we're going to look at covalent bonds. And you look at the first three sentences there, or actually four, it talks about covalent bonds. Um, involves two or more non-metals, two or more non-metals sharing electrons. Now remember, as you look at me on the screen over here, you know that here's the non-metal part, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so forth, all right? So they share electrons. They do that also with hydrogen, which is kind of a crazy thing to say. Hydrogen sometimes acts like a metal, but that's what happens with carbon and hydrogen. So as you look over on page 38, and you see them sharing the electrons in that figure 2 dot five. So instead of donating, they share those electrons. Look at the bottom. Look at the bottom of page 36. Table two dot one. Electron sharing in covalent bonds. That's what these bonds are called, covalent. They share the electrons. <clears throat> so as you look at these three types of bonds here, they're all covalent. But here you have single covalent bonds. That means they, they share, each one shares an electron with another atom. So this carbon, which has four atoms in its outer shell, can actually share with four hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ion has one electron. So that's a single covalent bond. A single covalent bond is, um, is associated with just each, each uh, element sharing one electron each. If they share two electrons at that bond, they call it a double bond, double covalent bond. 
If you look where the orbitals or the valence shells overlap, you can see not just a pair, but two pair. That's a double covalent bond. And then as you look at triple, they share three pairs. That's a triple covalent bond. Double bonds are real important to us when we start eating fat. We want fats, we should want fats, that have double covalent bonds. Those are the ones that are good for us. We'll mention that a little bit later. Now, let's wrap up here with nonpolar covalent bonds and over on page 39, polar covalent bonds. You see it says in non-covalent, non-polar covalent bonds, all elements have protons and those protons can to some extent attract electrons, property of neg negativity. Now, <clears throat> Look on the next page, 39, the more electro, and the come down to the third line, the more electronegative an element is, the more strongly it attracts electrons. And so now you see in the next little paragraph about nonpolar and uh, covalent bonds. Notice it says, when you look at that second paragraph, of the first column on page 39. When two nonmetals in a molecule have identical or nearly identical, identical electronegativities, they both tug on electrons with the same force. In other words, they're equally shared. This kind of bond is called a nonpolar covalent bond. The electrons are equally shared with each other. Look at the uh, arrangement down at the bottom of that column or, or in the middle of that column, you're looking at carbon dioxide. And you see you have an oxygen on one side and an oxygen on the other. And they've got a double covalent bond on either side of that carbon. They're sharing the electrons equally. That's a nonpolar covalent bond. Look in the next column on page 39. And I want you to look at figure 2.6. And look at the two atoms up above, two hydrogen atoms. They are equally sharing. Now you come down to B, where it shows a polar covalent bond. You see how the hydrogens are closer to each other? That is unequal sharing, as opposed to what you just saw in the first column. They're sharing equally in the first column on page 39. But here in this figure, 2.6, the water molecule, the two hydrogens are closer to each other. So there is a polarity there. As you see, looking to the right of figure 2.6, B, you see positive, but you see negative up at the top of the oxygen. So one side's a little negative, the other side's a little positive. That's polarity. 
or little difference in charge. One more thing, you see in the paragraph below, polar covalent bonds, exposure to that, and hydrogen bonds. Come to the last paragraph. When polar molecules are mixed together, they're partially positive and partially negative ends attract one another. The polar water molecules will line up so that the partially positive hydrogen atoms line up next to the partially negative oxygen atoms. And those are called hydrogen bonds. Now, keep in mind, we'll close with this. Keep in mind, as you look at that picture up at the top of the polar covalent bond, Two, two hydrogens being closer to each other as opposed to on either side equal distance. Look over on page 40. And you see these water molecules. Instead of having two hydrogens and the one oxygen in the middle, they're bent like that. And that's producing polarity. And now you see this attraction. The oxygens are a little negative, the hydrogens are a little positive, so the negative oxygens tend to have a pull toward the little positive hydrogens. That's what they call a hydrogen bond. It's due to polarity of the atoms. There are polar bonds and there are polar covalent bonds and so there are little charges on the outside. And those little charges attract each other. Positive attracts negative. You could take a penny, if you're really careful, and place it on top of water in a glass. And if you drop it, if you don't drop it, but just lay it on there very carefully, it'll float. Because these bonds, these hydrogen bonds, are like little elastic be, uh, bonds, and they give a little bit. So it creates what we call surface tension. Surface tension. You can see surface tension, page 40, second column. That's why little bugs can ride across the water. They can walk on the water because these hydrogen bonds sort of make water a bit elastic like that. Gives just a little bit. Doesn't break. Gives just a little bit. Do you have any questions, Sarkira? Have you gone to sleep yet? Are you there, Sharkira? You haven't gone. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to close it off. All right. Good. I'm glad you're there. Um, any questions? So come Thursday at 10 o'clock, we will pick up with chemical reactions and see if we can get through uh, chapter two. Got to be hustling, aren't we? Okay. Well, I'll look forward to seeing you or hearing from you. Come, uh, come Thursday at 10, but also be looking in D2L because uh, there's some things in week one that Mr. Malakowski wants you to look at. You can click on them, um, get into the e-text and look on the left-hand side and you'll see week one and go into that. And you'll see also some 
some uh, videos that he's put on there for you. Okay? Thanks for hanging in there, and I'll see you come Thursday.